much for tuning in to a new Our Science Matters interview. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Mr. Robert Hazen. He's a distinct mineralogist and he will be sharing with us today some of his amazing work in this vast and wonderful field. You will hear such things as mineral evolution, which is a concept that was introduced by Dr. Robert, and we will also mention the deep carbon cycle and some other very interesting features of mineralogy in general and what makes it important. We really hope you like this interview and if so, please leave a comment below. Uh, we hope to see you in future episodes as well. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Robert. What a pleasure, Victoria. It's great to be talking to you. So today we will be investigating mineralogy and more interestingly, a new approach that Dr. Hazen has discovered to it. His work in 2008 introduced a new idea to the world and namely mineral evolution. Let us hear from Dr. Robert what exactly this idea means. So what is mineral evolution? Well, Victoria, mineral evolution is, is a very simple idea. It's that planets evolve and with the planets evolving, so do minerals, they change. So the minerals that we had when Earth was first formed almost 4.6 billion years ago, those minerals were fewer in number and, and different from the minerals we have on Earth today. And there were successive stages of mineral evolution, each of which brought on by new physical or chemical. And remarkably, um, at one point, uh, new minerals formed by biological processes. Life forms minerals. And it was this, this realization that planets evolve and their mineralogies change through time. Uh, it was so exciting. And that's led my career on a new pathway. Yes, this sounds like a very uh, simple yet very new idea that was introduced by you. It's a huge contribution to the field. And just as a person who is more familiar with the idea of evolution feels like biology, naturally the question comes, what is a mineral species then? And what criteria can be used to understand the evolution of species when it comes to minerals? And Victoria, it's very easy to get um, sort of off track here because biological evolution has its own distinctive character uh, Darwinian natural selection and evolution through genetic change. Minerals don't do that. You know, quartz, a mineral that's uh, defined as a mineral species. It's, it's defined like every species as a pure chemical composition and its crystal structure. And every unique combination of chemistry and structure is a mineral species. And there are almost 6,000 of them now that are recognized and approved by the International Mineralogical Association. And, and those species themselves, at least in one sense, don't evolve. Quartz that formed four and a half billion years ago, silicon dioxide in the quartz crystal structure. And quartz that's forming today in many geological environments is also silicon dioxide in the quartz crystal structure. But there are differences that quartz formed four and a half billion years ago had different trace and minor elements. It, they had different fluid inclusions. Uh, they had different sizes and shapes and, and all sorts of other detailed properties. Now those don't figure into mineral species because mineral species are idealized, but they do figure into our system of mineralogy where we embrace all that rich information. So if you take a quartz crystal, you know, like this, this, specific crystal has a history. It has a story. It was formed at a particular time and place in a particular environment with chemistry and, and the physical environment and perhaps microbes, perhaps biology played some role in this crystal and this crystal therefore different from other crystals of quartz. All the same species, but the kind of quartz is different. So, so that's, that's something we're embracing is all this information that minerals carries, the stories they tell. Every mineral is a time capsule. It has, it, it, it tells of how it formed and it tells about its subsequent evolution through time because minerals change over those billions of years. Um, and, and I love those stories. So that's sort of what mineral evolution meant to me. Yes, and you're definitely very good at telling those stories, Mr. Hazen. 
Uh, one thing that has always surprised me because I have been collecting stones and minerals since I was little too, was how much uh, the strict definition of a mineral reduces the complexity and the beauty of what we see in front of us. That's it almost true. seemed unfair that when we look at a biological species, there are like seven criteria that we use to put it, to sort of fit it into a box that would be good enough to hold it in. While as with minerals, we have just those two very uh, one-dimensional characteristics. And that is exactly what your work in my mind has improved. And I, I'm just so happy that we can share this today with everybody else in our audience. So uh, you briefly mentioned the idea of biosphere being connected with minerals. Um, I know that your work has focused in extensively on the surface interactions between minerals and uh, also enzymes and different characteristics that help answer such fundamental questions as the origin of life and also the um, right and left handedness of molecules. Can you briefly mention your work in that field, please? Sure. So many of us who have thought about the origins of life, ancient, maybe 4 billion, maybe in war longer ago than that. I've thought about, well, how do you do the chemistry? How do you get things started? How do you concentrate the molecules? How do you select them and create an environment where life can move forward? And one possibility, not the only one, but one very important possibility is that minerals played key roles. Minerals could have played roles as reactants. They actually provide the, some of the atoms for life. Minerals could have selected and concentrated molecules. They could have acted as templates. So one of the things I studied, I just happen to have a crystal here. Um, so this is a crystal of the mineral calcite. And you know, it doesn't look biological at all. It just looks like it looks like a crystal specimen. And my thought was this: life has one really strange idiosyncrasy. It uses handed molecules. So you know, you have a left and right hand, which are basically the same planes of objects, but they're mirror images of each other. And in life, the molecules that life uses are often mirror images as well. So the amino acids that make up all the proteins in your body, those are what we call left-handed amino acids. You don't use right-handed amino acids, you only use left. And the sugars that make up all the carbohydrates and, and the structures that, that we use and the food we eat, those are all right-handed sugars. Even though in any pre-life scenario, you make equal numbers of left and right, and yet life only uses the right-handed sugars and only uses the left-handed amino acids. And how in the world can that be? One possibility is you create local environments on early Earth that were handed. And so where, where are handed environments built into the world? Well, look, look at this calcite crystal. Um, if, you, if you can see that, there's a mirror running right down the center of this calcite crystal, and there's a left-handed face and there's a right-handed face. And my idea was, well, gosh, is it possible that if you stuck this calcite crystal into a liquid that had a mixture of left and right-handed molecules, could the left-handed molecule stick on one side and the right-handed molecule stick on the other side? And that would give you a local concentration. And, and lo and behold, that experiment, it was a very, very difficult experiment. It took, took a year and in clean labs, I was wearing one of these, these like a hazmat suit and it was completely sterilized and, and the water it was expensive water. It was like 50 euros for a gallon of this water, which is ultra, ultra, ultra pure. But in the end, we were able to show that left-handed and right-handed molecules stick on different faces. Now, that doesn't solve the origin of life at all. What it means though, is that minerals could have played a role in creating local handed environments, left-handed environments, right-handed environments, places where more chemistry could have taken place, where molecules could have been concentrated and selected and, and then go on to do other things. So, so that was just one of, of you know, there are thousands of people who are doing interesting experiments in origin of life. And a lot of them now use minerals for, for various reasons, because minerals were chemicals that were widely available on early earth. And why wouldn't you use them if they were there? Yes, absolutely. And this is a very elegant answer to you. First time I heard it, it blew my mind completely. Yeah. I mentioned that there are actually three ways that in Earth's recent history, we have more and more carbon being locked in the deep interior of the Earth. So what does that all play 
in our understanding of DeFi, right? how much DeFi can we expect in our planet? So the, this whole question of the carbon cycle and how it operates on a global scale was a question that we asked uh, with a scientific program that I had the pleasure to, to be involved in directing um, over a 10 year period from about 2009 to 2019 called the Deep Carbon Observatory. A lot of funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in the United States, but also um, other funding from agencies around the world. And ultimately there were more than 1200 scientists, that's a lot of scientists in 55 countries. So, so we, we explored this question of carbon from crust to core and, and a lot of focus has already been put into carbon right at the surface of Earth. You know, the atmosphere, the oceans, the, the biosphere. But what we realized is that there wasn't the same amount of attention being paid to the deep carbon cycle. And that means the carbon cycle going all the way down into Earth's core. How much carbon is down there? How does it move? Does it affect the surface? And what we realized in, in our work is yes, there's, there's a lot of carbon. A lot of carbon is being buried by subduction. A lot of carbon is coming back to the surface through volcanoes. Um, and, and so, you know, CO2 gets emitted by volcanoes. So as a natural source, the volcanic CO2 is the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. We want to know how much carbon dioxide is that? Does it sort of balance what's going down and, and does it, is it comparable to what humans are producing? And, and the answers are kind of startling. Um, first, it turns out more carbon is going down than it's coming up. So, so over you, you can do an estimate that in about 400 or 500 million years, um, there may be a bit of a carbon deficit. It may be a limitation to life. Um, it isn't today, but it, it could be. And that, that's sort of an amusing thought. We don't have to worry much about it. Uh, don't lose sleep. Um, but the other thing is that the human input of carbon to the atmosphere is, is you know, an order of magnitude or two greater than all the volcanoes on Earth. The volcanoes at most in, in, a, in a busy volcanic year produce maybe four or five percent of the CO2 and all the rest is, is from, from human activities. So that is, that is certainly a concern. But the Deep Carbon Observatory was not trying to make a political statement. What we were trying to do is make the scientific baseline so that people who work on policy can answer the question, well, aren't volcanoes doing this? So why should we care? And of course, volcanoes aren't doing it to that extent. So yeah, yeah, we better care. <laughs> we, we certainly better care, Victoria. It's, a, it's an ongoing concern and it will continue to be for, for quite a long time, I think. Yes. And we we already see the changes in terms of environmental impact. I think I read um, some type of uh, research on this question with volcanoes and trying to compare them to anthropogenic sources of CO2. I think the result was that Florida alone produces more CO2 than <laughs> all volcanoes combined. I think that's very possible. Yes, but that's... Definitely, that we do need scientific baselines for understanding carbon and the, the long term cycle as well as the short one. But what about other planets, Dr. Hazen? Could, can we expect such a complicated carbon cycle somewhere else too? So, when you think about carbon cycles or the cycle of any element, what makes them complicated like they are on Earth? Well, Earth is a number of things. Um, and, and of course, for carbon, biology is one of the big ones because life really has affected at least the surface environment in, in a very major way and redistributed carbon. Um, but any chemical element on Earth has a relatively complicated cycle. And it's we've discovered in recent work that it's primarily because of water-rock interactions. It's Earth's water cycle, the hydrological cycle, where there's constant circulation, plate tectonics taking water down, water coming back up in volcanoes, water circulating through the crust and upper mantle, um, huge volumes of water interacting with rocks, selecting and concentrating elements. So for example, all of the, the metals that we use in industry, iron and cobalt and nickel and zinc and copper and lead, and you go on this list, um, those are all picked up by hot water circulating through rocks, they're transported to a different place and then they're deposited out. That's why we have huge ore deposits. 
on Earth. And, and so the question for carbon and for any other element is, are there comparable processes in other worlds? And in some cases, absolutely not. The moon is dry. There's, there's no hydrological cycle. There's no selection and concentration of ore minerals. I doubt if there are any big ore deposits on Mars, or on moon, excuse me. And same thing with mercury. Mercury, um, you know, we just don't, we don't see, um, it's not large enough to have a lot of internal heat and it doesn't have a lot of volatiles. Um, you know, there's no atmosphere, there's, there's no lakes or, or ponds on the surface. So, so, so a number of worlds on, in, in our solar system, they're not gonna show a big carbon cycle, they're not gonna show other cycles. But, but in some cases, um, there are really interesting possibilities. Mars was probably very much like early Earth a long time ago. Um, so Mars, I don't know if it's living, there could be a subsurface biosphere. That's, that's a, an intriguing possibility. Microbes living deep underground. If you took Earth's microbes and transferred them to certain places on Mars today, they'd be very happy and microbial colonies would start growing on Mars. And it's just, I mean, because they have, you know, they have the energy that they need, they have the uh, nutrients that they need and, and they wouldn't be, you know, taking over the planet and making it a living world like Earth anytime soon, but they'd survive. Um, the question is, is the same thing true for the, the ocean worlds, uh, Europa or Callisto or Ganymede, um, Enceladus? Uh, those are really interesting moons that, that appear to have subsurface water and probably have a hydrosphere. If you have a hydrosphere, you can support some aspects of life that we understand, and you certainly can have very, very complex chemical systems, not just the carbon cycle, but as I said, any other element that can move around with the water. The water will select and concentrate the element one place, it'll deposit someplace else, and then you'll get these very interesting, um, what, what are called gradients, just, just concentration gradients, which drive all sorts of interesting chemistry, including the chemistry of life. So, so that's, you know, from a NASA point of view, when we go to other planets and moons, we're really looking for places where you have a dynamic hydrosphere, which is a prerequisite, we think, for life and for any of these dynamic um, chemistry, for concentrating resources, for example. And water itself is an incredible resource. Water is a, is a resource that can be used um, split apart to, to make fuel for powering human, um, you know, sort of habitations and so forth. So, so I think when we look at our solar system and other worlds as, as a geologist and, and as a, an astrobiologist, the first thing we look for is water. Yeah, for sure. I remember myself when I was younger, I kind of viewed every other planet in the solar system as its entire cosmos. Like maybe there's life there, maybe there's not, and there's no way of knowing that. But what your uh, courses or your lessons that I've seen really helped me understand is the deterministic approach that mineralogy gives us for understanding how far a planet has gone in its evolution. And this is exactly what I think your work has shown me most clearly. There's ways of understanding that we can predict a, which way a planet will go based on where it is, based on what elements we started off with, based on its size, based on all of those things. And I wanted you to mention some of those criteria, if you could, very briefly. Oh, sure. So so if you think about the rocky planets, I mean, and, and we have to take a step back here. I mean, there are several planets that we call rocky planets. And then as you go farther out from the sun, you've got these larger, what are called gas giant planets. And as the name implies, the rocky planets have a lot of rocks and the gas giants have a lot of gas. And the, the reason is simply because it gets, as you go farther from the sun, it gets colder and colder and colder. The rocks condense out at very high temperatures, so you get rocks close to the sun, but as you get farther and farther out, it's not until you get pretty far from the sun that things like hydrogen and helium can condense out and then they can form a planet. And so we're, when we're looking for life, <coughs> excuse me, we really focus on the inner rocky planets. Um, and that's the one that, that are more like 
like Earth. And so that's what we're doing right now. Or the moons of the large planets that, that also seem to have more water and rock like the moons of Jupiter and of Saturn. So, so those are the targets. And when you think about mineral evolution of these worlds, that it seems to go through stages. And we can recognize those stages in world after world. There's a certain determinism to this. Um, so the earliest stages in all of these is you have to form the, the minerals that make up the building blocks of planets. Those are the meteorites. And so I think I have a meteorite. Oh, I, I think I do, yeah. Thanks, Here you have a, a meteorite that's, that's got um, the building blocks. It's, it's, it's got uh, all the minerals and also the volatiles that will eventually make up <clears throat> any of the planets. They condense out. So the first stages of mineral evolution are just making the minerals that form the meteorites. And the meteorites come together into larger and larger clumps. Planetesimals and the planetesimals collide with each other and gravity keeps building larger and larger things and you get planets. The first stage of mineral evolution on virtually every one of the rocky worlds, the moons and the planets, is forming basalt. Uh, it's it's this, this black rock. If you go to Hawaii or, or Iceland, you'll see basalt forming today. It forms the ocean floors. It forms most of the surface of, of all the terrestrial worlds. And that's the first stage. And then you have subsequent stages. You have, um, you know, you form a hydrosphere. You have fluid rock interactions at a surface that gives you new minerals. Um, on Earth, you form life and that gives you additional stages of mineral evolution. And to a rough approximation, we can look at every world in our solar system and say, which stage should it get to? So Earth has gone through what we estimate is 10 stages. Uh, we may be in an 11th stage right now, which is human interaction with the surface because we're, we're producing all kinds of, you know, I got, a, I got a cell phone here. It has all kinds of materials in it that are mineral-like and it gets thrown in a landfill and that'll be a geological marker horizon a billion years from now. Those, that landfill will still be there as part of the sedimentary record. But if you look at the moon, it probably only went through the first three of the stages of mineral evolution. If you look at Mars, it may have gone through the first four or five stages of mineral evolution. And, and so we see this, as you say, a deterministic aspect of mineralogy. Each stage follows logically from the one before it, as long as you have things like plate tectonics or fluid rock interactions, or in the case of Earth, life. And then you get these new stages. Yes, so what I find very interesting is that although there is this very deterministic uh, pattern, which I do not personally see as clearly in biology even, uh, but nonetheless, there is a lot of chance or what might be called accident. So not everything is determined. And I was wondering if you consider plate tectonics to be one or the other. So which oh. box would you put it in? So for plate tectonics to begin, you need to have a planet that's large enough that the heat transfer from the center of the planet moving to the outside happens most efficiently by the process of convection. Going back to just the laws of thermodynamics, th th there's three ways that heat moves from the hotter object to the colder object. It's always going to move. Heat always transfers from the hottest thing to its surroundings. One way is conduction. Heat flows through a, an object. You know, so if you have a, um, a, a piece of metal and you put a hot surface on one side and you put your hand on the other, eventually the heat's going to flow through. That's convection. If you have a pot of boiling water, you heat up from the bottom, but the water circulates. That's convection. And that's a very efficient way to move heat. That's what your fan does or when you have a... a, a a wind coming out. So all three processes occur in Earth. It's the convection of the mantle. It's looking at this whole very, very long term, hundreds of millions of years that soft fluid rock um, moves in this way. And in order for that to happen, you need to have a lot of heat at the center of the planet, and you need to have a, a large enough planet that it sort of bottles up that heat, and then it melts it from below, and then, then things can go. <laughs> so it looks like you know this was inevitable on Earth, and if you had another Earth and you played the tape over again, tectonics would happen again. The cool rocks at the surface 
sink down because they're denser and the hot rocks at the bottom rise up because they're less dense and, and you get these patterns of circulation and heat flows from the center to the, to the crust of Earth. And that's, that's a process. Um, it may have happened on Venus early on. Um, Venus is a little bit different right now. The surface is extremely hot because it uh, has so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that you have a runaway greenhouse. And so the surface is extremely hot and, and maybe convection doesn't work quite as efficiently on Venus. That's, that's still something that we need to understand. Mars is a little bit too slow, too small to have an efficient convection cycle that the heat's radiated out. And so you just don't have enough internal heat to drive that kind of process and, and have the, the molten interior and the, and the crust cracking and sinking down and, and new rocks rising up. There certainly is volcanism, but it doesn't appear to be a plate tectonics kind of thing. So, so we, we have, you know, it's just amazing. I mean, there's a deterministic aspect to it, but you need to know, you know, how much water is there because water drives convection. You need to know um, how big is the planet, how hot is the planet, you know, what's its bulk composition. All of these are factors. As we look beyond our solar system to find exoplanets, the thousands of exoplanets that are now discovered, I'm sure some of those planets have something like plate tectonics going on in them. Um, but each one may be a little bit different from Earth. The compositions may be different. The sizes and the, the amount of heat, uh, the atmospheres, those are all going to play a role. The nature of the star, because the star provides external heating as well. So how close you are to your sun, that's going to play a role. So all is, is fascinating. There's, there's, and, and as you suggested at the beginning, you, you don't want to, when you're looking at natural systems, you don't want to say, oh, it's just two things. It's just chemistry and structure. And that's all we need to know. No, every natural system has myriad variables, uh, attributes, characteristics, and, and it's by understanding how all of those attributes and characteristics come together to make a complex system behave as it does, that's where we're going to have real discoveries. And, and to me, this is one of the most exciting frontiers of science. One of the things I want to get involved in this is, is thinking about multidimensional systems and methods of data science, visualization, analysis, that will reveal patterns in these very complex systems that really are the ultimate way to think about complex systems. Yes, thank you so much. It, it really brings forth the importance of mineralogy. And I was just wondering your opinion, can you share with us, because we have a young audience as well, what we should look for in the future to make an impact with mineralogy. Yes. So, so you're absolutely right, Victoria. Vic minerals are, are just incredibly important. I mean, basically think of it, almost all the atoms around you, I look around my room and I see, I see wood and I see glass and I see uh, you know, paints and I see me and, and I'm looking at you and your room and your furniture and so forth. And, Virtually all the atoms of that came from minerals. Minerals is the source. Our agriculture depends on minerals. Our industry depends on minerals. Um, they're fundamentally important. They're also the oldest objects that you can hold. When you hold a meteorite, you're holding something that's four and a half billion or more years old. It's the only thing we have that survives from the earliest periods of our solar system. And so they tell a story unlike any other objects we have. If you want to understand the history and the evolution of earth or other worlds you have to study the minerals and and it's not just that i mean i, I just think minerals are are so beautiful they're so varied they're so gorgeous i mean they're aesthetically uh, there's there's the fundamental physics and chemistry that's revealed by minerals is unparalleled um, there have been more nobel prizes awarded for research on mineral like compounds than just about anything <laughs> else because because there it's it's fundamental um and and so if you want to understand planets or you want to understand life if you want to understand just the basic way the universe works um minerals are a window into all of those and many other scientific aspects so so it's really it's it's really fundamentally important to study and and you can also, if you want to be a mineralogist, you get to go outside, you get to 
you know, spend time in beautiful places, remote places, or all around the world. I've been on almost every continent and and have hammered on rocks in, in remote, beautiful places. And and you get to collect things and you get to meet fascinating people. And there's some, um, you know, it's it's really quite um, a wonderful way to spend the life. I've, I've, I've my wife sometimes asks me, you know, um, have you decided yet what you want to do for a living? And I say, you know, I'm still working on it, but. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to have fun doing mineralogy because it doesn't feel like work. And being able to read them is about the coolest thing that I can imagine anybody be able to do. Because in your book, you mentioned that knowing our home is knowing a part of us. And I think that couldn't be more right to the point. It's true. It's true. It's true. Thank you so much, Mr. Hayes. It has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your time. It's been my pleasure entirely, Victoria. Best of luck.